Hey everyone, I'm Kirby Master, and I'm here with my first real tier list video. I've never really done anything like this, but I spent a good chunk of time setting this up, since, well, it's kind of a nice excuse to talk about three houses and three houses speedrunning as a whole. Obvious warning, this will obviously contain spoilers for all four routes of three houses. So to preface, preface, a few months ago, Mecha posted a new Pitfalls video highlighting how different LTCs and speedruns are from each other, LTCs being low turn counts, and a lot of people mix them up all the time. I highly recommend watching it. And I've seen a lot of people make arguments about how a tier list should be based off of speedruns for reasons such as speedruns care more about reliability unlike LTCs, or they finish the game, quote, acts actually quickly while LTCs don't, and so on. Which obviously isn't really true, especially since a lot of LTCers really care about reliability and sometimes even forego turn saves because they're too unreliable. Um, but the point I'm getting at is that speedruns ultimately a terrible metric for standard tier list discussions, contrary to popular belief, and aren't a great comparison to LTCs at all. Long story short, speedruns play the game at such a niche, unconventional, and unintuitive way, contrary to how anyone plays Fire Emblem at all. One big factor is that speedruns typically run the game on the fastest difficulty. This often means easier difficulties, yet most tier list discussions typically assume higher difficulties, as that's when unit differences are distinguished more. That's only one of several reasons. For example, in speedruns, I may tier a unit highly because they're really bad. Since that means they're easy to kill off, meaning they waste less time than a unit that's bulkier or better or competent. A real example of this is Astrid and Radiant Dawn. A uh, tier list focused on speedruns would easily place her in mid to high tier since she saves us about one minute in Chapter 3E, a map where you need 80 deaths on the map to end the game, end the map. And Astrid is a perfect candidate for that, saving us about one minute because she's fragile and mo mounted. Or, I, could, I would tier a unit more highly just because they happen to be de deployed in a convenient spot to save some menuing. If it wasn't obvious, speedruns are also are not deathless, and they abuse glitches and RNG manipulation when possible, all things that people typically don't do casually. Um, and obviously people are free to speedrun however they want, but there is a reason deathless or glitchless or manipulationless runs usually don't exist, because they tend to be more tedious without adding, adding much to the run. Um, most standard tier list discussions, not related to speedrunning, assume deathless and no glitches because that's how most people play the game. Again, going back to my point on how speedruns play the game at a real, such a niche, unconventional, unintuitive way. Last point, people frequently say, well, tier lists for speedruns are only janky because you're basing it off of black screen speedruns. They'd be ideal for games that tell these games, which is referring to how you can skip enemy phase and stare at a black screen in a lot of the more modern Fire Emblems. To be honest, this is kind of an ignorant response because it misses the entire reason why speedruns are bad for tier lists. With or without Black Screen Simulator, speedruns still play the game in a niche, unconventional, unintuitive way. Going back to my previous example on Astrid being high tier in Radiant Dawn, this has absolutely nothing to do with the black screen. Another good example is Path of Radiance Shinon. He would be high tier in Path of Radiance speedruns because he doesn't counterattack as a sniper, which saves us map animations. In fact, if Path of Radiance was a black screen speedrun, then Shinon would actually be less valuable, since his faster animations, or lack of, would be irrelevant, and he'd be lower tier, closer to where actual tier lists would put him. In other words, the fact that Path of Radiance is not a black screen speedrun is the reason Shinon would have a really janky placement in a speedrun tier list compared to standards. And so on. So no, black screens are not the reason that speedruns are bad for tier lists. Anyone claiming this completely misses the point. With all that out of the way, I'll be covering the units in three houses, since recently, to prep for my SGDQ race against Claris, who is also another really good runner, I've been actively running all four routes at the time of this recording, and I'm pretty familiar with the current speedrun meta. Obviously, this is subject to change. Speedrun routes are constantly changing, and I want to emphasize that speedrunning is a collaborative community effort, as with LTCing as well. Um, some ground rules. I'll be tiering units based off of how they contribute to the four standard routes on the standard speedrun difficulties. Crimson Flower, Azure Moon, Verdant Wind, and Silver Snow. I'm not including Cinder Shadows, since it's not really a standard route, and it's hard to standardize this alongside four other routes that play similarly with each other. Cinder Shadows is basically its own separate game. Some of these placements should come as no surprise, but there will be others that will be really out of place compared to standard casual lists. We assume normal classic difficulty, as it's the fastest difficulty, and what speedruns are typically done on. Obviously, normal difficulty plays completely differently from maddening, but even if there were to be a maddening mode speedrun tier list, it would look nothing like how standard maddening tier lists would look like. Um, units would get more credit if they contribute to more than one route. This is ultimately pretty subjective, as there are units who are extremely important to one route, but only run route 
but there are also units who are less impactful in individual routes, but they contribute to multiple routes. I'll be calling this out appropriately. This is obviously subjective, but I'll call it out. A rule of thumb I'll be going by is, if a unit is so useful in this current speedrun, how much time will I lose if I don't recruit or use them? Is their utility in the speedrun unique, or are they replaceable? Are they a nice backup? Do they help with reliability? Or, if they are not currently used in the speedruns, how much time do they lose from existing in my party? How much time do I lose if I have to recruit them, because the tier list assumes I use them? You'll notice that the higher tiers will have a lot more discussion because they all have actual roles in the speedrun. Then as I gradually go down to tier lower and lower in the tier list, I'll have less to say because lower tier units just don't have much to contribute. Okay, so onto the tier list. <clears throat> the, top of S -tier, the top S tier is for units who are the main carries. The speedrun completely revolves around the units up here. The rule of thumb in Fire Emblem speedruns overall is the fewer, units, the fewer units you use, the better. Using more units costs time, because moving more units, gaining more level ups, seeing more animations, deselecting units, celebrating more birthdays, learning abilities, etc. all cost time. Female Byleth here is the main carry of part 1, then Edelgard, Dimitri, Claude, or Sedith, which I'll be moving them into this spot here soon, they all become the flyer carry for part 2 for their respective routes. Several other units contribute with various utilities such as battalions, dancing, warp, rally, smite, and so on, but nobody else really carries the speedrun. So, to no one's surprise, female Byleth is up here. This goes without saying. She is available in every route and is the main carry for part 1 in all routes. She is less relevant in part 2 because, again, the flyers carry and take over the run from there. But she contributes to all four routes, and part 1 is a longer, more volatile and important part of the run. So this is the big reason why she's in S plus tier and, uh, and not any of the house lords. Her boons and sword and brawling are really nice. They're the lightest weapon types, and we want lighter weapons early game since we need the speed to double attack or quadruple attack. So she hits D brawling pretty quickly, so she can use steel gauntlets by chapter 5, which is effectively a plus 8 damage boost. And she also gets her own weapon, the Brick of the Creator, which is unfortunately kind of an underwhelming weapon. It's really heavy and not super powerful. But it is a 1 to 2 range weapon, and her main 1 to 2 range option for most of the game. Conveniently enough, because we're skipping every weekend in the speedrun, um, the weapon gets repaired every month. So that's really convenient, so we can be really, really um, liberal with it. <clears throat> Ruptured Heaven is also a really good ranged combat art. So overall, the Brick of the Creator is kind of nice, despite its flaws. But in Chapter 10, it becomes the Sublime Creator Sword, which is a really strong weapon and a really much needed upgrade. It weighs less, 15 might, 90 hit, 10 crit, upgrades Ruptured Heaven to Sublime Heaven, which is even better. Every route typically certifies Byleth as a thief, which requires sea swords, which is easy to hit, thankfully, thanks to her boon and high sword rank, base sword rank. Um, this, because of this, the thief and mercenary classes are the only reliable intermediate classes she can certify as. And the thief class gives her unrestricted force movement, which is important for a handful of chapters. Mounted classes like Pegasus Knights and Cavalier are really good, but they require faculty training, which is a lot of time loss, so they're n not a good option. Mm. And there are also routes where she can go Archer, which is also a big commitment and time loss, but pays for itself by letting her skip half of Miklon's map, along with giving co convenient 1 to 3 range. But this isn't a commonly ran route because it's unreliable. Alongside this, alongside getting her sword upgraded, she also becomes the Enlightened One as a free certification, which is convenient. It's, although it's not like the best class in the game, um, it's still a pretty solid infantry based class with sword fare and plus 2 strength, and her personal ability gets upgraded to let her deal plus 2 damage. So she basically just got plus 9 attack power. Um, and it also the certification for the um, Enlightened One can also patch up her defense if her defense stat is kind of screwed. Which can happen, because her defense growth is one of her weakest, weaker growths. Female Atlas deserves special mention in Silver Snow Part 2, because while Sedith is the Part 2 flying carry in Silver Snow, we do need the extra Thunderbrand Swordfire offense for Endgame, and Silver Snow Endgame is a complete shit show since the last boss has Miracle and fully heals, and Violet just cannot one round without any getting crits. <clears throat> and the reason why female Violet is up here but not male is because female Violet allows us to recruit Sylvain for free, which is really important because Sylvain is the best dancer option for three out of four routes. He is the only dancer option for Crimson Flower, and he also gets us the Lance of Ruin in Silver Snow. The last thing to note about Byleth is that crests are typically inconsequential, but her Crest of Flames, which is a 20% chance to heal herself with an attack, is actually really important. 
because in a speedrun where she's enemy facing so much with an unreliable 35% defense growth, um, the Crest of Flames really helps improve her survivability. I can guarantee that in almost every run you do, the Crest of Flames will have saved you time from having to use vulneraries or even save her life. This is really notable in maps with heavy enemy phases like the Auxiliary Battle, Chapter 2, Chapter 3, Chapter 5, Chapter 7, Chapter 9, and the list goes on. Um, so yeah, the self-healing effect again isn't that impactful casually, but it's really vital in the speedrun for both reliability and saving her player phases from healing herself. So yeah, I don't think there's really any arguing that anyone can even share the same tier as Byleth. Nobody carries Part 1 as hard as her, nobody does it in so many routes. Easy S plus tier. So, then we get down to the S minus tier, and this is where all the house stores are going to go up, so I'll go ahead and move them up here. Plus Zedith. Give myself a short break too. <laughs> But yeah, before I get into the House Lords, which are Edelgard, Claude, and Dimitri, there's an important mechanic I need to go over that's pretty relevant for speedruns. During time skip, the House Lords all become certified as their advanced Lord classes, meaning their base stats go up to the base stats of the Armored Lord, or the High Lord, or the Wyvern Master class, as a level 1 unit. For example, Claude goes up to 17 strength as a level 1 unit. Okay, and then everyone gets a specific number of auto levels typically, but in normal difficulty only, every unit below level 20 gets auto level up to level 20. So all of your house lords will get 19 free level ups off screen. So they'll typically start part 2 as a level 20 unit, which is under leveled, but with ridiculously broken stats that you would expect a level 30 unit to have. They'll, the house lords will typically have like 29 to 30 strength on average at the start of part 2, which is kind of absurd. And they also get a free authority buff to see authority, which is really nice, because that lets them use some nice flying battalions. Okay, so we have Edelgard here. Um, she, her goals are set to accordingly so that she learns weight minus three and can certify as a Wyvern Rider at the start of part two. And then she becomes the main flying carry. Um, she has 38 HP, 17 strength, 17 defense as a level one unit, thanks to the base stats of the Armored Lord. And then gains 19 levels on top of that. Unfortunately, bulk isn't really that important in Crimson Flower, but it can be kind of nice here and there. As she's, this route is very player phase oriented, so it's unfortunate that her bulk isn't going to be put to good use, but it is there and it is nice. Um, her average level 20 strength upon time skip as a Wyvern Rider is 31.4 strength, and alongside Axe Fair and Brave Axe and Amir, she can just one shot most bosses. So speed actually isn't super relevant for her outside of like end game. Which, speaking of which, she gains absolutely no speed from her certification, unfortunately, and that's kind of her weakness. Um, thankfully, the Wyvern Rider certification bumps it up to 17 if she's really speed screwed. So, worst case scenario, she's guaranteed average ish speed at time skip. Thankfully, again, it's not super crucial for her to be fast in the speedrun since she relies on combat arts for most of her boss slaying. It's only a really an issue for endgame because she has to quadruple attack the last boss with the Brave Axe. And, of course, she also has her signature weapon to Amir, which lets her use Raging Storm, which is a really good combat art, and also lets her move again. <laughs> it's so broken that the speedrun goes out of its way to destroy a Titanus' barrier to farm for more Agarthium, which is the material used to repair the Amir. Um, just for endgame. Raging Storm is a tool that is not replicable by any other unit in the game without New Game Plus features. Um, so. Claude is just below her, and while Claude in the speedrun is kind of a better unit than her in terms of raw stats and combat, Edelgard's Raging Storm is just a not a unique tool that nobody else has, and for that reason, I put her above Claude and Dimitri. And the last but not least, um, this is minor, but Edelgard can contribute to Part One in Silver Snow. By um, we don't really care about her stats or skills, so we set her to bow and armor bow because she has a bane in it, so she learns as little as possible, and armor so she can smite. Um, so, she does technically contribute to more than one route, unlike Claude and Dimitri. Next, we have Claude, the main carry for Verdant Wind Part 2. Like Edelgard, he's pretty much set to... Set, his goals are pretty much set for um, as much reliability as possible for Part 2, but since he gets his own free flying class, he doesn't really need to worry about training a flying rank. Most tier lists would put Dimitri over Claude like this, for good reason. Battalion Wrath and Battalion Vantage is Dimitri's signature combo. And Claude is pretty good in standard Madden gameplay, but to quote Rangor, he lacks anything that makes him utterly broken. But in the speedrun, when you rely on abusing the time skip mechanic for certifying our house lords at level 1, 
and when the speedrun cares more about simplicity and is ran on normal difficulty, Claude outclasses Edelgard and Dimitri in terms of raw stats. The devs clearly didn't care about balancing wyverns, and it's apparent if you compare the base stats of the Armor Lord and High Lord classes to the Wyvern Master. Literally every base stat in the Wyvern Master class is better than Dimitri's High Lord class. It's kind of absurd. To further hammer in, hammer in speedrun Claude's raw combat prowess, he gets his flying class for free, as I mentioned before. Dimitri and Edelgard have to invest in flying in order to become Wyvern Riders. Claude doesn't have to bother with that. He can just throw all of his skill points into bow rank, so he can learn bow prowess 5 and bow crit. This is partially mitigated by the fact that Axe Prowess gives more hit, while Bow Prowess is balanced between hit and avoid. Um, Axe Prowess give, level 5 gives plus 20 hit, whereas Bow Prowess level 5 only gives 15 hit. But it gives a bit more avoid, and this is the route, Bread and Wind is the route where dodge tanking is really important, so it works out in his favor. And of course, using bows means he also has more range, which is really nice. And he also has 8 move when he gets his free Barbarossa class, which Edelgard and Dimitri are stuck with 7 move as Wyvern Riders because they just won't have their ranks to certify as the Wyvern Lord class, which won't be worth it anyways because certifications cost a lot of time. On top of his really broken class, Claude gets Pass, which is admittedly situational, but really useful when it matters. You can just ignore enemies, which is really important in Hunting by Daybreak and Dubstep, which is um, Talus' chapter. And ignoring enemies is important because killing more enemies means more level ups, which means more time loss. His personal combat art, with the Fail Knot, which is his whole main relic, is Fallen Star, which is a really good combat art, even if it's not Raging Storm. Um, Fail Knot has 3 range, and Fallen Star gets plus 10 might, plus 10 crit, and most notably plus 30 hit, which is really valuable for a few specific dodgy bosses, like the Death Knight, or Gloucester in Endgame, or Nemesis in Endgame. And he also gets a secondary effect where he's guaranteed to dodge whatever hits him first in enemy phase. Which is normally a really situational secondary effect, but it's extremely valuable in a speedrun because it further boosts his dodge tanking for endgame, and it guarantees he can't get killed by Hubert in Chapter 19. Which is notable because Hubert has a pretty high crit rate with his siege weapon. And it also guarantees he can dodge a hit from Nemesis, who hits him pretty hard. Claude gets the Immortal Corpse as his main battalion for the speedrun, and it's really good. 8 plus 8 attack power when it's capped, and plus 15 avoid, and the best gambit in the game, Ashes and Dust. <clears throat> but it is kind of overrated, and it really shows in the speedrun, because while the avoid is really nice for late game, it also gives 0 hit, and ironically, Claude, despite having the highest dexterity growth in the game, he has the least reliable hit rates out of all, all the house lords, because his battalion doesn't give him any hit. Unfortunately, we don't really have all the alternatives in the Alliance, because the Alliance Battalions are all pretty garbage. So, from everything I've said, I'm making it sound like Claude's the best House Lord in speedrun, and overall, he kind of is. But, again, Edelgard's Raging Storm is a tool only uni unique only to her, and Claude doesn't have as much uniqueness to him as Edelgard does. He has his Broken Free class, and he also has Pass, but they are nice, but they, they aren't Raging Storm. So... And I think this position for him is justified. Finally, we get to Dimitri, and he's the main carry of Azure Moon Part 2. Um, again, he, we train him up in axes and flying and riding, so he can certify as the Wyvern Rider class and get Dexterity plus 4. Um, <clears throat> he's casually known for his Battalion Wrath and Vantage combo, as I mentioned before, but in a speedrun, that's completely irrelevant because it requires high authority, and low battalion and low endurance battalion strats are really unreliable in speedruns. We need him to invest in Axe and Flying Rank so he can go Wyvern, which sucks because he has an Axe Bane. But he can still make it with 100% success rate. Um, again, another ex example of how different Dimitri is used between the speedrun and casual gameplay, especially if you compare him with casual maddening. So yeah, there isn't much to say about him that hasn't already cover been covered. He's really good, he's broken, but that's about it. Like He doesn't have pa Raging Storm, he doesn't have Pass, he just has really good stats, but yeah. He can use Atrocity, which is nice for one-shotting a few enemies, That's about, but that's about it. He has the highest defense growth out of the Lords, but which is relevant for Endgame, but since he has to take a lot of hits from the last boss. Um, you can kind of tell that I'm really grasping for Shiraz and Notable Traits for Dimitri, because there just aren't any in the speedrun. This alone kind of explains why I'm ranking him below Edelgard and Claude. So, he doesn't have much else that makes him unique. He's Don't get me wrong, he's still really important, hence why he's an S-minus tier. But he just doesn't have anything else going for him unlike Edelgard and Claude. And finally, the oddball, Sedith. Um, 
yeah, Sedis is kind of weird. Um, he, because and I actually considered putting him up here at one point because he contributes to multiple routes, and I also kind of wanted to just prove a point that steel lists and speedruns are bad. <laughs> but nah. I decided against it. He's still up here because he's just a very flexible, very solid unit. In standard tier, tier lists, he's usually like mid-tier because of his lack of availability. But with the criteria I'm going off of, he's available in multiple routes, he's free, and he is the flying carry for Silver Snow. He doesn't get the broken stats that the house doors get because he only gains one on one auto level from level 20, like 27 to 28, I think. I don't remember off the top of my head. But his stats are at least less volatile because, again, he's only relying on one time skip level up as opposed to 19 in a row. So, and he's a free Riven Rider, and he has a free reclass to a Cavalier, which is nice in Azure Moon. He has a high base authority of B, and a high rank in Lances and Axes, so he's just very flexible as a combat unit and as a utility unit. <clears throat> um, in Azure Moon, Sedith is currently used as the Blue Lion Dancers unit. Again, the Blue Lion Dancers is an A rank battalion that allows you to dance for four units and let four units move again, including your dancer, which is really broken. Um, with Seta's high base rank, authority rank and his free Cavalier class, it's pretty broken to have a Dance of the Goddess user with 7 move and cancel. <laughs> yeah, so having that flexibility it make, it makes it pretty broken. Um, and we get to Silver Snow, Seta's strongest route. He is the main flying carry of Silver Snow Part 2. Um, and where he stands out compared to the House Doors is his combat flexibility with his high ranks. He can use the Hammer, he can use the Brave Axe, he can use the Horse Slayer, he can use the Blessed Lance. You can also use the Lancer Ruin, although it's E-Rank, so anyone can use it, because you don't actually need a crest to use relics, the game lies to you. In standard matting tier lists, he's most well known for being a Swoop Strike Boy alongside Sylvain and Ferdinand Von Eyre, and he puts it to, put, he puts it to good use in the speedrun. Um, he Swift Strikes Lorenz with the Horse Slayer, he Swift Strikes Lottie Slava with the Lancer Ruin, he Swift Strikes the Death Knight with the Horse Slayer, which is an option, although it's better to use Knight Nui with Lancer Ruin. And he swift strikes the last boss in the game with the Blessed Lance to prevent a counterattack thanks to his crest, since his crest gives a 50% chance per hit to avoid a counterattack. Um, Night Kneeler, again, as I mentioned, is also really nice. Night Kneeler plus, plus Lance of Ruin is the ultimate combo for one shotting the Death Knight, which is really important. And the Monster Piercer is his another combat art that's pretty situational, but can be nice for the last boss if you have to like burn RNs with random numbers with it somehow. But yeah, long story short, while his stats aren't broken, he does offer his own set of tools that makes him perfectly confident in, competent in the Part 2 speedrun for Silver Snow, and for free too. Um, the fact that he is a flying Part 2 carry yet also contributes to multiple routes and requires almost no investment is why I put him up here in the same tier as the House Lords. So now we're getting to the A tiers. This tier. A plus and A minus, this tier is for units who provide extremely important utility or unique utility, but they aren't hard carries like the units up here. Um, if we were to remove any of the units from the speedrun into A tier, the speedrun would change drastically, even if they aren't any of the carries. So to dive in, top of that would be Shamir. She is a pre-promoted sniper, and, and because you can recruit her kind of early, with the sniper base stats, she has really broken stats. <laughs> and she is such an important unit that every route, besides Verdant Wind, goes out of its way to recruit her because of Chapter 6. Chapter 6 is a map where you have to either kill the Death Knight or route the map besides killing the Death Knight. And obviously just bopping the Death Knight is a lot faster. But the most reliable way of doing that without warp is having Curve Shot with a sniper with 4 range. And Shamir is the only convenient way to do that. Um, so yeah, <laughs> quick clearing chapter 6 is so important and saves you so many minutes that that alone jumps her up to A plus tier. She typically does need rally strength, to be fair, to, so that she doesn't get double attacked by the Death Knight when he counters, but that's not really too big of a deal. Um, the point is, nobody else can do what she does. She has a relatively low time cost of recruiting her for 3 out of 4 routes, and for that reason she's at the top of this tier. She is a competent unit for a mid game for combat, most notably for Chapter 9, which is the route map where Dad dies and you have to kill a lot of monsters. Um, and then after that, she becomes a main stride bot for late Part 1 and most of Part 2 in every route she's in. Because she's effectively a free 5 move unit, which is more useful than it sounds, because 
she doesn't. You, we don't need a certification to get a five move unit since we already got one with Shamir. A five move stride bot is way more valuable than a four move stride bot, and you don't really have many other options for stride botting since we kill off most of your units in the speed run. And she plays a pretty notable row and role in Endgame Silver Snow, where she has the flexibility to attack the last boss with 2-3 range and destroy a barrier with Monster Blast. Um, she also is important for allowing us to break the Titanus' barrier in Crimson Flower so we can farm for Agarthium for more Raging Storms, thanks to her, again, her 4 range. So yeah, easy A+, she's amazing, she's really important. And then next units are going to be the two Warpers. I'm going to move both Lysithia and Linhart up here. They're very similar units in a sense. And it's just easy to talk about them together since their contributions are similar. I'll point out the differences, of course, but let's talk about Warp first. So Warp allows you to teleport an adjacent unit to a distant target. It's very important. I've seen a lot of people say that Warp on an in-house student isn't useful in a speedrun because it's only 2-3 to three range, which is a little bit ignorant to say because that 2-3 to three range Warp makes a huge difference. That's game-breaking. You don't need more than 2 or 3 Warp range to skip a wall which lets you skip going all the way around the map, like twice, <coughs> Miklon. <coughs> um, and it just saves so much time. It saves a lot of time for, um, for maps such as reaching Solon in Kranya's map, skipping the ledge in the Holy Tome so you can reach the Flame Emperor, skipping the wall in Enbar to reach Edelgard, skipping all the walls in um, the Dubstep map, and getting battles across the houses in Crimson Flower. Um, she would otherwise have to go all the way around the map because she's on foot. Um, Although, keep in mind that Warp does have an animation that's slow, so it's often better to burn a turn or use something like Smite instead of Warp if you can help it. And because Warp is slow, and it gives you experience which you don't want because level ups are slow. So like, Warp is typically only used for skipping walls or if no other repositional options exist. So very important. As for Lysithia and Linhart themselves, Lysithia learns Warp at B-Faith, which that alone completely changes their Verdant Wind route. It lets that Verdant Wind route warp skip Chapter 5, McClone's Tower, which again is huge. Admittedly, this fast clear isn't possible without also recruiting Catherine because and the Thunderbrand. Um, so she doesn't deserve all the credit for warp skipping Chapter 5, but she, yeah, that's a pretty huge deal. She's also recruited in Crimson Flower, not for warp, unfortunately, because she auto levels reason and authority when recruited out of house, but because in Crimson Flower she's the best and most reliable unit for killing Dudu in Chapter 17, because Dudu is kind of a ridiculous tank, <laughs> and like imposs almost impossible to kill physically. Um, Linhart, on the other hand, he learns Warp at A phase, which is way later than B phase, but still suffices. And like, it sounds like a big deal, but besides Chapter 5, Warp isn't really that useful until Chapter 9. Like, you don't really care about having Warp until Chapter 9. And by the time you hit Chapter 9, he learns warp. Um, he does contribute warp to two routes, whereas Lysithia only contributes warp for one route. So that's one of the distinguishing things. Lysithia helps the combat in one route and warp in another route, whereas Linhart's warp contributions aren't as strong as Lysithia's, but he contributes with warp to two different routes. Um, he's also responsible for letting you farm more Agarthian for more Raging Storms and Crimson Flower, because again, he can warp Pilot across. Wait, did I mix that up? I think I mentioned. No, no, I mentioned Shamir. Breaking the barriers. Yeah, Linhart's the one who warps Pilot across to break the barriers for the Titanus in Crimson Flower, so we can get more Raging Storm. I might have accidentally said that Lysithia does, but that's not true, it's Linhart. But that right there is also very important. And so one could argue this if you wanted to, um, for the reasons I just listed, but personally, I think Lysithia's contributions in Chapter 5 alone are enough to put her above Linhart, but I could see it being argued either way. Okay, next up we have. Sylvain. He is the best dancer used in every route besides Azure Moon. I don't think I need to explain how valuable dancers are. They're, they allow you to move a unit again. So if a unit is strided with plus 5 move and you dance for them again, you can have like a 10 move unit move twice in the same turn and one turn, two turn chapters instantly. They're invaluable in speedruns, and dancers do cost a lot of time to get because of the dancing competition, but it's so worth it. Um, Sylvain himself is the primary dancer, because he's the only student in the game with no recruitment costs if you're female. Conveniently, when he's recruited in Chapter 9, which is the chapter with um, the dancing competition, he has 14 charm, which is exactly enough to always win the dancing competition. In Azure Moon, he's not used as a dancer because he's an in-house student and his stats suck, 
at base. So instead, Charm um, Flane is going to be Flane is typically used as a main dancer for Azure Moon, which I'll get into later. In Silver Snow, he's also recruited before Chapter Five, which gets us the Lance of Ruin, which is an invaluable weapon for the Silver Snow speedrun, even and very useful in Part One as well. When he is recruited earlier in Silver Snow, he does have lower base charm, but dance practice is enough to get him up to 14 charm again, so that's not really a big deal. So yeah, it might seem weird to put Sylvain below the Warpers, and under most circumstances, um, for like other Fire Emblem games, I would do something like this probably. But the reason I put him lower than the Warpers and Shamir is because his dancer utility, dancer utility is replicable. Like, almost anyone can be a dancer in this game. If Sylvain was hypothet hypothetically gone from all the routes, you can always just make Flane your dancer instead. She's slower, but she is a viable option as a dancer. As long as it's not Crimson Flower. Um, she's just a slower option because her location is more further out of the way in the monastery than Sylvain's location. But that being said, Sylvain is the only dancer really available for Crimson Flower, so that is his unique contribution, and he contributes to every route. Even in Azure Moon Chapter 1, he contributes to that map with by being a Tempest Land spot. So. Yeah, putting Sylvain above or below the Warpers kind of comes down to how much you value unique utility with Warp versus contri his contributions to all four routes. So, next up after Sylvain is Flame. Um, everything I said about Sylvain and Dancing applies to Flame as well. She is a potential dancer for every non-Crimson Flower route thanks to her high base charm, but she is slower than Sylvain because of her poor, annoying location. She is the primary dancer option for Azure Moon though. But on top of that, she does provide other valuable utility in most routes. She's the main support unit for Chapter 7 in non Azure Moon routes, which is. And Chapter 7 is the Battle of the Eagle and Lion, and that chapter is a shit show. It is a three way battle, and after the first three or four turns, the map's gonna be different every time you play the game. Like, different every time. And Flane is just invaluable for that because you need all the reliability and healing you can get in that map, and Flane gives. Just that. She provides Miles some necessary bulk via her personal ability, which makes adjacent allies take less damage. I think it's two less damage, and that adds up. She is also a healer that's not underleveled, um, which is really important because that saves Byla's player phases, because otherwise Byla would have to burn turns healing herself with vulneraries. And rest she also learns rescue and restore, and they're situationally nice in Chapter 7, um, but yeah. Rest Restore is mo more notably nice in Chapter 7 because it lets you heal Byleth if she's seal strength or if she's rattled. Although, speaking of Rescue, Rescue does provide a few nice options for helping sk skipping Kranya as a nice backup strat, um, depending on the route. Unfortunately, her existing costs a lot of time too. After Chapter 7 and Verdant Wind, she is actually killed off intentionally just so we don't get extra lecture questions. And killing her off early also makes it so Sadis doesn't join you in Verdant Wind, which also saves us two extra, cuts out two extra lecture questions, which is a crap ton of time save. Again, not something you would do casually, but in the speedrun, that's what you do. <laughs> so, yeah, that's why she's up here. Um, next up is the Rally Goddess, Annette. She's only out outright recruited or used in our team in Azure Moon. And, oh, oh god, I'm so glad she's in Azure Moon, because that is the only house in the game that does not have an in-house warper. But the blue lines do compensate by having a net. Rally Strength is so invaluable. Rally Strength is invaluable for reliability. It gives Azure Moon a near-guaranteed one-turn option against Kranya, a luxury that the other routes wish they had. Um, and, like, for example, other routes can only really one-shot Kranya if Byleth has, like, 28-29 strength with average magic or something absurd, um, when their average is usually, like, 25 at that point, 26. I'm, I'm just making up numbers, but you're rarely gonna hit the strength benchmark you need to one-shot Kranya. But with Annette, you're almost always gonna hit that benchmark. She is also what makes Shamir's Chapter 6 quick kill possible. Again, Chapter 6 is the map where you have to shoot the Death Knight with Curve Shot to end of the map immediately. Um, so yeah, training her in authority in Azure Moon um, lets her learn rally resistance and speed, which aren't strictly necessary, but they are nice, um, especially in Chapter 7. And she actually used to be the main Blue Lion Dancers user in the speedrun, but was has been kind of obsoleted by Sedith thanks to him having um, high mobility with, as a Cavalier. But even without that though, she her authority boon 
is just really nice because the Blue Lions have a lot of really broken support battalions that are high rank. And in the current route, she does use the Sacred Shield Battalion, I believe, um, which is B rank. So, yeah. Ironically, Rally Speed is not really that useful in a speedrun because what, outside of like a few early game benchmarks, you don't really care much about speed. And Rally Resistance is a lot more valuable in Chapter 7. Again, Chapter 7 is the Battle, battle of the Eagle and Lion. Um, and Blue Lions is the only route where in Chapter 7 we use we do not use Flank. Flank is used in the other three routes as your healer or support unit for Chapter 7, which is a Byleth solo, of course. Everything is a Byleth solo. But Azure Moon is the exception to that because while Annette doesn't provide Lily's Poise, which is Flank's personal skill, she does learn Recover, which is, in my opinion, the most underrated support spell in the game because topping someone off without needing any extra help is really valuable. Like. You really wish you can heal like more than 20 HP so many times in speedrun, but Flane just can't do that because heal is so bad. Um, even with her crest, it's usually not enough to top Byleth off. Recover is also nice in the Moxer chapter for chapter 9, because Byleth can take a lot of hits pretty easily. And Rally is also nice there if she doesn't need to use Recover to make chapter 9 more reliable. Again, Annette's really useful and really nice. Um, and Rally Resistance is... A really nice in Chapter 7 because you're facing a lot of magic users sometimes from the Re Black Eagles and having plus 4 res is really nice to just be able to survive. Um, so, And usually some people penalize her for not getting experience when you not getting experience when using Rally. which That's normally bad, but like in the speedrun, experience means level ups. And level ups are bad. So the fact that Rally doesn't give any experience at all is really good. Because experience is slow. Experience is bad. Um, last thing to note, she technically contributes to more than just one route because she is recruited as a mission assistance unit for what's it? What is it? Silver Snow and Crimson Flower, the two other routes that use Shamir to cheese Chapter Six. She's temporarily recruited as mission assistance, so we can allow for a faster Chapter Six clear. So she does technically contribute to more than one route. So, like bottom line, she's an Annette is an invaluable support unit throughout the Azure Moon speedrun both for going fast and for reliability, and she also contributes to two other routes in an important manner. She is indeed our girl. So the last unit that belongs in this tier, in my opinion, is Catherine. Where is she? There she is. <clears throat> so I, when I talked about Lysithia, the entire part one of Verdant Wind is different from the other routes be, just because of warp, getting warp early for chapter five, and we have to level up Byleth and grind her and go out of her way to grind Byleth so that she can hit level 15 to recruit Catherine. Um, why? Because we, by warp skip, if we need, if we can warp skip chapter 5, we need a way to kill the boss really quickly. <laughs> or else we're just gonna get swarmed by enemies. And Byleth just can't do that by herself. Catherine herself has monster base stats thanks to her Swordmaster bases. And she comes with the Thunderbrand, which is, again, is a brave weapon. A weapon with a brave effect, so it attacks four times if you're fast enough. And it's just very powerful, and because Catherine has Swordfare, it's even stronger. <laughs> Thanks to Catherine, we, we can two-turn Monster Miklon after the warp skip. And yeah, that alone is really valuable. And then after that, in the Verdant Wind speedrun, she kind of fulfills Shamir's role as the stride bot or the help or the combat helper for chapter nine. Again, she's another free five move unit that kind of falls off, but then is just a nice convenient five move stride bot. Um in Silver Snow, she does also help. She joins for free in Silver Snow in Chapter 12 alongside Cyril, and again, gives us a Thunderbrand for free as well. Um, and she's actually trained up in bow rank, hilariously enough, in Silver Snow, because um, we need more ranged options for the last boss, because Endgame Silver Snow is a complete shithole, shitstorm, even in normal difficulty. <laughs> but. Training her up in Bowrank allows her to use the Blessed Bow and the Brave Bow, which gives us plenty of options to burn our ends or finish off a health bar if we get Miracled, which is really nice. The reason I put her at the bottom of A+, here is because she's not really as vile as Shamira overall in early game, in my opinion, and she and her part one contributions are only vital in one route, as opposed to Shamira, which is three routes. Um, her Thunder Band is really important in Silver Snow, don't get me wrong, but I don't credit that to her, I credit because no matter what you do in Silver Snow, you're getting the Thunderbrand for free. It's effectively the same thing as Sublime Creator Sword in a sense. Like you get the weapon for free no matter what. So I don't consider that that I don't consider that a point in her favor personally. 
but despite not having like warp or being a sniper, she's invaluable in Verdant Wind and also helps out another route, and that's why she is an A plus tier. <clears throat> I need a short break because I've been talking way too long. Okay. So yeah, the rest of that list is gonna go by pretty quickly, don't worry. <laughs> Alright, so A- minus here, we're only going to have one unit here, and that is, to no one's surprise, Manuela. For one reason, warp. <laughs> she is, to quote Rangor, a third string warper, and she is the only feasible warp user for Blue Lions in the speedrun. That's the only reason she's here. Um, she learns warp later than even Linhardt, so she can't help with warp in Chapter 9 or Chronic's map. Um, she, you have to go out of her way for her as opposed to Linhard or Lysithia, where they're already in-house students, so she's just inferior to them, basically. Inferior. Inferior? Talking is difficult. Bleh. But also, unfortunately for Manuela, Azure Moon is the route where a warp is at its least useful. Um, we only use it three times. One, Chapter 11 to, in the Holy Tome to get up to get Byleth up the ledge with the Flame Emperor. Two, Chapter 21 in Enbar, so we can warp Flane across that darn fence that exists only in Azure Moon. And then Endgame, to get Dimitri across the wall. Other routes have warp used like six or seven times, but it's at its least useful in Azure Moon. And so she's just way less useful than all of these units up here, but she's still important. She is still very important. And I, important enough to belong in the A tier, I just think that there is enough of a difference between her contributions and everyone else up here that that warrants kind of a small split here. <clears throat> but yeah, so that's the A tier. B tier, let's go. This B tier here are for units that do help out in the speedrun with minimal or no investment. They're, they, they aren't like anywhere near as vile as the A tier units. Um, the speedrun wouldn't change a huge amount if we missed out on the B tier units, but like they, they do come with free utility, they're helpful, they're convenient, but they're not necessarily vital. That's pretty much it. So, first off is Gilbert in B tier. Probably one of the most underrated pre promotes in the game. I used to think he was one of the worst units in the game, because like, LOL, 2 base speed, but he's actually pretty underrated. Like, he's not hard to start to find into something like a Paladin or something. Like, this game is a good, is an example of where, of a game where like, stats aren't everything, and Gilbert's one of those units where his how good ranks really help him out. Um, but in the speedrun, that's irre irrelevant. His main contribution in Azure Moon, which is his only route, is joining for free at no cost and starting with D Authority and free Smite. Smite is good. Smite is faster than Warp. We don't want to Warp if we can help it. And D Authority means he can use the Kingdom Archer's Battalion, which is Retribution, and the Kingdom Cavalry Battalion, which is a second stride battalion, which is actually really important in Azure Moon. Azure Moon is the one route where having two strike bots is really valuable. And having a free filler unit to do that is really convenient, even if it's replicable, technically. His high bulk is also nice in Endbar, because he strides like a group of units in the upper right corner and so that they can all catch up to where Byleth is, and Gilbert just kind of chills there for the rest of the chapter. And by rest of the chapter, I mean that one turn. But he gets hit by a lot of physical units, and he has enough bulk to survive for the most part, so... That is nice. So, yeah. Free, Utility with Stride and D rank Authority in one route, B tier. Next we have Dudu, which is pretty funny. <laughs> so yeah, um, Dudu is really annoying to kill off in Chapter 1. Like Chapter 1 is- ch Chapter 2, sorry. Chapter 2 is the map in every route where you want to kill off every student that you're not going to use. And Dudu is really tanky, he takes forever to kill off. Tasmania Jones, or Biospark, came up with the idea to keep him around instead, so we don't have to wait for him to die in Chapter 2, and instead, keep him around until like Chapter 11, I think. We set his goals to Faith and Armor. <laughs> so yeah, Armor is for Smite. Um, having He learned Smite by Cronio's map, which is nice. It makes the Cronio map go more quickly, and we don't have to rely on like Warp for repositionals, so Smite is just really good. And we set him to Faith so he can learn Recover, <laughs> which is pretty funny. Again. Dudu has terrible magic, but recover doesn't matter. You can top almost anyone off no matter how terrible your magic stat is. Going back to my point on how recover is a really underrated support spell in my opinion. And this saves a few seconds in Chapter 6. Because Annette needs to spend her turn rallying Shamir and Shamir in Chapter 6, and Shamir takes a beefy counterattack from the Death Knight, and we didn't have to do, we have to burn a turn to have Annette 
use Recover on Shamir, and then another turn to Rally Shamir. But ha by having to do a round, that saves us a turn. <laughs> so, yeah, that, and also just having another Recover bot for Chapter 9 is convenient, because Byleth does take a lot of hits, and having to do use Recover on Byleth frees up Annette's player phase so that she can use Rally on Byleth instead of Recover. So, and then he's immediately killed off in Chapter 11, because there's no point in keeping around him around there anymore, and he dies pretty much instantly thanks to a really nice, convenient auto battle strat that Tasmania Jones came up with. So he costs like almost no time to kill off. <clears throat> so that is why he's here. Um, ultimately, like those contributions sound really amazing and all, but he does cost time to keep around because each extra student you keep around costs around 10 seconds because each student is an extra lecture question. But I believe he is faster, he pays for himself, and he makes the run more reliable with Recover and Smite. Alright, um, oh yeah, and he's only available in Azure Moon, similarly with Gilbert. B tier is kind of for units that are only really used in one route, which is a nice segue into Yuritsa. Yuritsa is only available in Crimson Flower. Crimson Flower, he's, yeah, he used to be the Dudu killer in Chapter 17 in an older route, but he's been replaced with Lysithia, um, because she's a lot better and more reliable, so he doesn't really do much anymore. But that being said, he does help for the very first map of Crimson Flower. He has... We used to have Edelgard kill the Judith in their first map of Crimson Flower Part 2. But... Um, Edelgard... That requires buying a Training Axe for accuracy, and even then, Edelgard has shaky accuracy on Judith. But Claris came up with the idea to just use Yuritsa instead, which is really nice. Because um, he has 100 hit, thanks to Swordbreaker. And he also takes away an extra kill from Edelgard, which means one less level up on her. Whereas Yuritsa almost levels up, but he doesn't. And then he's conveniently killed off in the map afterwards. He gets dark spiked by an enemy Lysithia, which is perfect because that means all the experience he got went to waste, which is good because level ups are bad. Again, this is a speedrun. We don't want experience. We want to be as inefficient as possible with experience, or as efficient, as simple as possible. So, yeah, that's why Yuritsa's there. <laughs> he's nice for the first map, and that's about it. <clears throat> And then we have Cyril. Yeah, kind of a weird option. And Cyril is normally like a growth unit, and he's actually not too bad, typically, because he has really good... He probably has like the best boons in the game, and really good combat arts, learning Point Blank Volley and Vengeance. And he is forced into your class in Silver Snow, with mediocre base stats, unfortunately. Um, so he's just feller, and he costs time to have. So he, he, he lost, loses a time. Bleh, he loses us time. So, why is he in this tier? Well, if there's a route that benefits from free filler units, it's Silver Snow. And that's where he is free. The speed, we don't have to go out of our way for him. And he is a free stride bot available for dubstep and endgame. And Silver Snow endgame again is a complete shit show, and we need every unit we can to make it as reliable as possible. So, like, having Cyril beat a stride bot instead of someone like Catherine or Shamir frees up Catherine or Shamir's player faces because their actions are a lot more valuable. And that is worth noting. Um, so yeah, for that reason, he kind of fits the bill for B tier, which is basically like units that are convenient and free, but they only have but in one route. So, and then he's at the bottom here because while his contribution is pretty important in Silver Snow, um, it's something that anyone can do. He's just convenient. Okay, so down to the C tiers. <laughs> so to explain this tier, um, <clears throat> Pretty much every unit in the C plus and C minus tier are going to be for the units who help out in Chapter 1. Chapter 1 is the mock battle, where you have to take out the other two classes, and at that point in the game, Byleth hasn't really snowballed yet, so we can't really solo that map. And it's a route map too, so we need all the help we can get. <clears throat> so, and this is going to this is going to going to go by really quickly, just FYI. So, got it? Cool. Hubert, top of C plus tier. He helps out with dealing magic damage. He hits Dudu and Dimitri pretty hard. He helps out in Crimson Flower and Silver Snow, so he helps out in two routes. Um, Caspar also helps out in two routes because of Crimson Flower and Silver Snow, and he's also a valuable bait to get one rounded by Dimitri because his base stats are trash, <laughs> which is good because then Dimitri gets weakened and then we can finish him off in Chapter 1. So that's why he's here. He helps out in two routes, but he's below Hubert because of his shakier hit rates and accuracy. Um, Felix is up here. Um, his personal skill. 
Lone Wolf is plus 5 damage with no Battalion, which is really, really good, and makes him a complete offensive monster early game. And that is really good in Chapter 1. He's one of your hardest hitting units in Chapter 1. And then he's ditched after that. He only contributes to one route, which is why Caspar and Hubert are above him. Similar reason with Hilda being up here. Hilda helps out, chips stuff, hits stuff pretty hard with the axe, um, but only in one route, which is Verdant Wind. Her accuracy leaves much to be desired, which is why she's lower than Felix. So, pretty fast here. <laughs> Alright, C minus tier. Let me get some water really quickly. Yeah, so the C minus tier isn't really much different from C plus. The one thing that separates the C minus tier units from the C plus tier units are how much time they waste outside of chapter one. Like Hubert, Caspar, Felix, Hilda, they like learn they don't really waste any more time than other students by existing. They help in chapter one and they don't really waste extra time. The C minus tier is for students who help on in chapter one, but they do waste extra time. So like for re because like these units are annoying to kill off in chapter two because they're just, they're dodgier or they're in a worse position, they're bulkier, they're better units, meaning they're bad. <laughs> so, yeah, and it's as if speedruns are really bad for tier lists and shouldn't be the norm. <laughs> so yeah, first off, this is going to be a pretty small tier. Ferdinand von Eyre is up here. Um, he is a Tempest Lance bot similar to like um, Sylvain and Azure Moon, in two routes. So he helps out in chapter one in two routes, which is pretty good. And he, his personal skill gives him plus 15 hit, plus 15 avoid at full HP. And like, people talk about how he's like an amazing dodge tank, which is good, but personally I find a plus 15 hit really valuable casually, and I wish pe more people focused on that, because plus 15 hit is really good. <laughs> um, and he has pro probably the most reliable hit rates out of all your chapter 1 students, which is really nice. Because um, he has 100 hit on everything. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> But the plus 15 avoid actually hurts him in a speedrun. Because, so like, in Chapter 1, in Crimson Flower and Silver Snow, if Ferdinand Von Ari is at full HP and he gains a point of luck or resistance, according to Claris, which, and I think this is accurate from my testing as well, then Manuela is supposed to target him, but instead Manuela will target Edelgard instead in Chapter 1. And that is bad. You lose like 20 seconds if that happens. And that's because of his personal skill, which gives him more avoid, because if he has more avoid, then Manuela's AI is less tempted to attack him, and that's bad. <laughs> Even worse, in Chapter 2, the map where you want to kill off all your students, <clears throat> because of plus 15 avoid, he'll, he has a higher chance of dodge tanking everyone. So like he can easily lose you 3 or 4 extra turns in Chapter 2 if you're really unlucky by just dodge tanking over and over and over again. So like him being a dodge tank, quote quote early game dodge tank, which is not really a dodge tank, him having more avoid actively hurts him in the speedrun, and that's why he's in C minus tier. <clears throat> Leone is here for similar reasons. She has a similar role to Ferdinand von Iron and Sylvain. She is the main Tempest Lance bot, bot in Chapter 1. Um, and she so basically takes on Hanneman in Chapter 1 because she's just has she's good. I mean, she's really good, and she has good bulk too, which is why she's here. Because she's a good unit with good bulk, which means she is harder to kill off in Chapter 2. Um, Ferdinand and Von Eyre does lose more time to Leone, of course, but he does contribute to Chapter 1 in two routes, whereas Leone only contributes in one route. But you can kind of argue it either way, really. It kind of depends on how much you value Chapter 1 contributions versus like how much time you lose from dodge tanking. So, pretty small tier, but that's what they are. Okay, D tier. Nobody. I'm not putting anyone here. <clears throat> Why? It's because this is the point in the game where units no longer help and instead are just outright liabilities. Unit, all units above D tier, so all these units up here, um, they are all used in the speedrun in some shape, way, or form. Even if they have their liabilities, they are worth using, and they do save time, even if it's just for a map. Units below D tier that I'm going to be putting here, they are not worth using, they're not worth recruiting, they outright lose you time by existing, or you have to recruit them and they don't pay for themselves. You don't compensate. To really distinguish that gap, I'm going to leave D tier empty and go straight to easier. So in E+, it should come as no surprise that every unit in this tier are units that you lose time from existing. This tier is for units who are already with you. They're already in-house students, so they don't lose you time from being recruited. They just lose you time from existing. Um, and E- is also a similar tier, but the difference between E+, and E- is kind of similar to the difference between C+, and C-. Like, the units in E- will 
lose you more time in dumb ways than the Unison E plus tier. So, this will go by pretty quickly. So, Ignatz, Ash, Bernie, Ingrid, Petra. All these units do absolutely nothing in the speedrun. Their sole purpose is to get killed off in Chapter 2. They don't hurt the run any more than that, and they don't help the run at all. Ignatz is the most fragile out of them, so for that reason he's the best because he's the easiest to kill off. Ash is le le next least fragile. Um, okay, yeah, Ignatz is le more fragile than Ash, so a Ignatz is a better unit than Ash because he's worse. And Ash is fragile as well, so he dies quickly, whereas Petra and Ingrid are not quite as fragile. Bernie is the most fragile unit out of all of them, um, but she wastes time in two routes. That's why she is lower than Ignatz and Ash. Petra and Ingrid are a little bit faster and bulkier than the Archer, Archer students, so they're harder to kill off. That's why they're, Ingrid and Petra are both lower than the boat students. And Petra is lower than Ingrid because Petra wastes time in two routes, just like Bernie. Ingrid only wastes time in one route. So, yeah. And then we'll get to some of the more some interesting units down here. Top of E minus will be, tier will be Lorenz. So if you keep Lorenz's goals to its default, he learns an auto equips fire, and that costs a few seconds because you have to unequip it, so he dies in chapter two. That's extra time loss, like an extra second or two of time loss. That's why he's in this tier. Next, Marianne. Take Lorenz, what I just said about Lorenz, and remove the option to change the goal so she doesn't learn it, anything. She always has Nosferatu to equip, so you have to unequip it. That costs time from existing. Next, Dorothea. Take everything I said about Marianne, but worse, because Dorothea can technically lose you other more time if you make a mistake, since like you could technically move a student that is weakened next to her on accident, and she'll waste time by healing them and make them take longer to die. Although that should realistically never happen, but technically can happen. That's why she's lower than Marianne. Um, point is, she is a strict downgrade for Marianne in the speedrun context. And she also hurts two routes. Marianne only hurts one route. So that's why Dorothea is lower. Then we have Mercedes. Mercedes learns abilities twice in Azure Moon because of her low faith rank and annoying ranks. <laughs> and she's the only student in Azure Moon who learns two abilities if you don't change her goals, which is more time loss. Um, and I'm biased, but she's also particularly obnoxious as an enemy unit because she has like Miracle and Aegis and so on, and her AI in Chapter 7 is really obnoxious because she just sometimes doesn't attack at all for whatever reason. <laughs> and she just wastes so much time. To be fair, these examples I just listed are her as an enemy unit, so that doesn't really count against her, but it's still very annoying, and she learns two extra abilities, and thus I'm putting her here. Um, last is Raphael. He's a tank, so he takes a while to die. And if he takes damage, he can activate Goody Basket, which is, I think, a 6% chance to heal 10 HP, 10% HP, which makes it take longer to kill him, and also the healing animation just costs like 2 or 3 seconds. <laughs> uh, it's really dumb. And this is completely out of your control, too. So that, that's why he is the worst unit in the E tier. So, yeah. So. As I explained, the quote quote strength of the E tier units is that they're already in your house, so you don't cost time to, outside of existing. But the units in F tier, you don't start with them. You, you just don't start with them. Um, they have to be actively recruited, um, which costs a lot of time to do. Usually, like a minimum of a half minute because that adds extra lecture questions, extra abilities you learn, extra units you might have to deselect, and so on. Um, and they don't come close to paying off for themselves, as opposed to units like Sylvain, or Shamir, or Catherine. So, in F plus tier, Alois, Hanneman, and Anna. Um, I'm grouping them together because they all are similar in a speedrun context. Recruiting even one of these will cost you at least a half minute, but if you force yourself to recruit them, they could technically help you out with reliability. Alois comes with a high authority base, I think it's a high authority base. And he has Rally Strength and Luck, which is really nice, to be fair. And he has good combat bases too, but that's irrelevant in a normal mode speedrun. Hanneman has Rally Magic, which can buff the ma warp range of someone by one, but that's not really useful because, like, the speedrun is specifically routed around assuming you have four warp range, and if Linhar or Lysithia only have three warp range by part two, you can fix that with the Bishop certification, because the Bishop certification is guaranteed to have four warp range minimum. So, like, I guess he could technically learn Meteor if you set him to reason the entire game, but it's he has to hit A+, I think, 
A plus reason that he's just not going to do anything with that. So. <laughs> and then Anna. She learns Rally Luck. So she's basically Alois, but without Rally Strength. And an Authority Bane, and terrible base stats. So she's strictly worse. But at least she's available. So, like, you can recruit her whenever you want, so to be fair. <laughs> um, although, if you were forced to recruit her, you would want to recruit her as late as possible just to minimize time loss from, from abilities learned and stuff. So, yeah. Like, keep in mind, everything I said positive about these three units, they aren't actual time saves. They're just minor, negligible reliability improvements. They ultimately cost you a crap ton of time and don't compensate for it, and that's why they are down here. So, and then F minus tier. You'll notice a pattern here with F minus. Um, all the Ashen Wolves go straight here. Take all the time losses I just explained in F plus tier. Then add more loading screens, because this requires going into the Abyss. And I, mean, I haven't confirmed this myself, but I feel like the game takes longer to load if you have any DLC characters with you too. So they just lose you time from loading. I think. I haven't confirmed it myself though, but it feels slower. Um, so yeah, they're all in F minus tier for that reason. <laughs> um, yeah, Balthus. So, and to ex briefly explain the ordering of these units, Balthus is at the top because he le learns Rally Strength, which is really good, honestly. Um, but that just is not worth it at all because of how much time it costs to get him. So, it costs minutes. Um, and in Constance Unhappy, as shitty as they are to recruit in a speedrun setting, they at least have Rescue for Constance and Warp for Unhappy, respectively. And Constance does have a Faith Boon, <clears throat> and learns Rescue at B, so that's why I put her higher than Happy, because <clears throat> Happy does not have a Faith Boon, and she learns Warp at A, so like she's not going to learn Warp for a very long time. Um, so yeah, but they're both completely outclassed by like Flame, Linhard, and Lysithia, so doesn't really matter that much. Um, and I put them below Balthus because Rally Strength is so always useful, whereas Rescue Warp, you don't really need that. <laughs> and then Yuri. So fun story. People frequently come into the speedrun Discord and ask about why Yuri isn't used in speedruns and, and go like, well, he has so much speed, like 65% speed growth. Yo, yeah, but one. <laughs> in, in, in a casual playthrough, he doesn't he can't learn Darting Blow because he's a guy, so he's strictly slower, worse than like units like Ingrid and Petra in a mad enemy mode context. And two, this is a speed run. Anyone who unironically asks about using Yuri clearly has not bothered looking at a single speed run and doesn't get how they work because it's immediately obvious that he's absolutely useless. His only use is, is Authority Boon, which is nice to be fair, casually. Um, but you only need high rank battalion starting in part two, and like. Pretty much anyone can hit A or Authority by the time you need Retribution. So, like, an Authority Boon doesn't really help him, because, like, almost anyone do, can do it. Shamir hits A Authority to use Retribution in Silver Snow. Um, so, yeah, while his Authority Boon is nice in the casual setting, it's near useless in the speedrun, because pretty much anyone can do it as long as they're available. So, and, yeah, that's the tier list, except we're actually missing one unit. Oh, hi there, Male Violet. Um, this tier officially will be officially called Male Byleth, <laughs> and he is the worst unit in the game, the worst unit in this tier list. Um, so yeah, all the units I listed up here in E and F, they're units that do cost you a flat time loss, but they don't really lose you anything else. They lose you time, but they don't lose you tools. Male Byleth is the only unit in the game who does. He loses you, he outright loses you tools. Simply picking him, you lose Sylvain. And that is a huge deal in any route that's not Azure Moon. So the consequences of losing out on Sylvain, it, let, let's go through them. Verdant Wind. This is not impacted quite as much because um, we can make Flanar Dancer, but that does, that does cost you more time because the Verdant Wind speedrun route is designed around killing off Flane, so we don't get set it, so we skip three lecture questions. So Sylvain is a lot faster than Flane as a dancer, but you can still get a dancer if you need to. Um, Silver Snow. Same thing, Dancer Sylvain is technically replicable by Dancer Flame, but again, slower. But like, we want Flame to be a filler unit to open a door in Endgame. Like, and Silver Snow Endgame is the chapter where you want as many filler units as possible. And that strat is just not going to work anymore if we have Flame as our Dancer instead of Sylvain. And, yeah. And, 
No Sylvain in Silver Snow means no Lance of Ruin, which is a really important 22 might weapon for Part 1 reliability and for Sadis to carry Part 2. We lose out on a ton of options in Chapter 7 and 8. We lose out on an option, a reliable way to kill Chapter 7 to do. We lose a reliable way to kill an Armor Knights in Chapter 8, if Bilas is has average strength. We lose out on a fast kill on the upper right corner monster in Chapter 9, because that monster is weak to lances. Sadis has no reliable way of handling hunting by daybreak, because he relies on one-shotting assassins with the Lance of Ruin. <laughs> and he can't one-shot a Death Knight anymore with Night Kneeler either. He has to rely on a Swift Strikes, which for en the end bar map, that means he has to land two 50s in a row, as opposed to a single 60, which is terrible. And the list just goes on. This is a pretty huge deal, and destroys the single Silver Snow route. And then, Crimson Flower. If we use Male Bot and Crimson Flower, say goodbye, because Sylvain is the only convenient dancer option since Plane leaves your party. No dancer in Crimson Flower? Yeah, have fun with that. <laughs> to his credit, he does he is fu fully functional in Azure Moon. Um, but like he doesn't really offer anything unique, because Female Violet, he does the same thing as Female Violet, but technically worse, since like Hypothetically speaking, in Chapter 1, if you have to improvise it a bit, you may benefit from buffing Sylvain by having Violet next to Sylvain, because Sylvain is buffed when he has a female unit next to him. Male Violet can't do that, but that's like, not really relevant, but technically, she is still better than him in Azure Moon. Um, but like, he is also kind of better in Cinder Shadows than Female Violet, for what it's worth, because of Hilda's personal skill, but like, that also is barely relevant. That's also barely relevant, anyways. And I'm not talking about including Silver Shadow, Cinder Shadows in this tier list. So like, that's not really factored in here. So that's why he is the worst unit in the game. And that's the tier list. Um, yeah, <laughs> this is the tier list that I made for Three House of Speedrunning. And if you want another look, we have our main carries up here, and then our important utility units, convenient filler units. Chapter 1 fodder, and then the Chapter 1 time wasters, the units that cost time to recruit, and then we have Male Byleth who deserves his own tier. <laughs> so this was pretty fun to type up, honestly, and talk about. Um, and I've never done something like this, so like this might be kind of unorganized, but I, had a, I still had a lot of fun doing this. And I'll save an image of this and link it in my YouTube channel too. So that's going to be it for now. Um, this was fun. Feel free to comment and say whatever you feel like. Um, although I think I would have a pretty good argument for any good argument for like every one of these placings, but feel free to counter. Um, what's it called? Critique it if you want to. Um, this isn't. This is obviously not like a super serious thing. This is just a for fun thing. This is my tier list. Anyone can make their own, but this is a good example of why speedruns are a bad metric for evaluating units, because like, male bios being the worst unit in the game, all of these units being really bad because of loading screens, Bernie not being top tier because she doesn't, because Bernie's amazing, she has vengeance, she's usually really good because vengeance and yeah, and then you have like units like Sadith who's like one of the best characters in the game because of how the speedrun is designed around him, whereas he's normally mid tier due to availability and I can just go on and on and on and on and on, but Bottom line is that, like, yeah. <laughs> That's gonna be it for now. So, um, thanks for watching or listening to me ramble. Um, this was fun to make, and I don't know if I'll do another video like this again. Maybe for another game. I don't know. We'll see. But until then, I'll see you next time. Have a great day.